Last time we were, we were looking at um, the way the doctrines of the world are seeping into the church and um, the rise of liberality and modernity, which removes the fetters so anything goes, political correctness and erotic and emotional elements being fanned by the marketing industry to sell goods and things. And all this is coming in and pressurising the church to behave like the world. So a number of churches are taking on those things of the world. And one of the things that, that it's looking at is marriage, singleness and celibacy. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We've got a little, um, a little advert coming up in a, in a minute. So that, uh, that TV licence really is putting forward what the world thinks of our relationships. Here we come, we meet, we get all excited, we move in together... Then we decide to get married and have children, or sometimes the children come before all of that. And then we come to divorce. And it's as if that is expected. And because we are Christians, because God has got a different way for us, the world doesn't often very like that. And so we get a lot of questions. That is recently we've had the questions of homosexuality. Is homosexuality a sin? Is same-sex marriage relationship a sin? And we found that the world started to pressurise Tim Farron and Theresa May because they are Christians. They didn't ask an Islam, any from Islam, because they also believe the same, but they, they can feel free to challenge Christians. But the big question is, not what Theresa May or Tim Farron might think, or what anybody else might think, is what does God say? Last time I spoke, and this time as well, remember that it was about the doctrines entering the church. This is not a doctrine for the world. The world's got its own doctrines to which it's entitled to, and they can carry on in their own sweet way. But if they carry on in that way, they will not be entering the kingdom of God. The doctrines that we're looking at is what should be expect, what God expects of us, what God expects of all of this. Now, we can look at marriage and we can think, well, some people will say, yes, after they've been married for a number of years, marriage is a life sentence. Okay. Others think various other things about marriage. Well, it's only part time, we're not going to worry. But what does marriage actually say? What does God say about marriage? Well, I've looked through the scripture and there isn't a lot of help in terms of definitely saying, look, this is marriage and this is how, how this happens and this is how this happens. There's nothing about the, the, uh, the, the institution of marriage in terms of how you get married, Okay. But what it, marriage has done, it has grown through a population in order to safeguard relationships so that one person could say, yes, this is my wife, and the wife could say, yes, this is my husband. Leave us alone. We're a couple. And we also have children, and therefore our children can come along and be part of that family, and we become a family unit. So we've seen it grow in sort of a natural means or in accordance with tradition. The first mention of marriage in a certain way, in, in, to a degree, is that set out in Genesis 1 and 2. So we're going to look at a few verses in Genesis 1 and 2. And Lord, we need your help in this. We really do. Look at uh, Genesis 1, 26. We'll start from there. Then God said, let us make man... Now, the word for man there is Adam, okay? And Adam means, they, it's thought to mean red or from the earth, earthy, okay? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, what do they mean? This is God speaking according to our likeness. So God is saying, look, we're going to create man similar to us, Okay? And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that cre creeps on the earth. God created man, that's Adam, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
Sing that all singular, isn't it? And then suddenly he goes, male and female, he created them. He created them. So God is created male and female together. And God saw, in verse 31, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. What God has created in man and woman, he is saying, is very good. And in that relationship, is very good. That's two words that we ought to hang on to. Now turn to Genesis 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man Adam, whom he had formed. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So what we get there is that man was created, seems to have been created outside of the Garden of Eden. He created the Garden of Eden, and then he popped man into the garden. Okay, This is just a man, singular, male. Verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man, Adam, to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now that then really describes what marriage is all about. But there are certain words in here that don't often come across very clearly. So we'll look at it again. Verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man, that's Adam, to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I don't know what you've got in your Bibles for that. Have you got a helper suitable for him? You know... That is a very misleading phrase because it, it's sort of putting the woman, oh yeah, this woman, oh yeah, she's suitable for me, God. Yeah, I'll have her, she's suitable, she's okay. But that wasn't it at all. God made the woman out of the bone of man and the, the real essence behind it is corresponding to him. In other words, she was the same as him. They were equal. It wasn't, oh yeah, she's my helper, she's, a, she's down there sort of thing. It was, no, she's out of my side, she is equal, she walks alongside of me. We are a pair, we are a couple, we are one, as God goes on to express the phrase. It's a unity. Then we can drop down to verse 23. The man Adam said... This is now bone of my bones. Yes, she's part of me. And flesh of my flesh. She's just the same as me. She shall be called woman. The Hebrew is Isha. Okay? Because she was taken out of man. The Hebrew is Ish. Ish, ah. Okay? Out of man. That's the close relationship between a man and a woman. The, man, the woman was taken out of man. That's the position. 
Now God created Adam out of the earth, out of the ground. The woman he created out of the man to show that they were equal. If he had created each one out of the earth, each one could have said, oh no, I'm separate. God made me out of that bit. God made you out of that bit. We don't have to go together. But he didn't. He made the woman out of the man so that they are unique and can be together. They have a special relationship. And God said at the time, all that was good. When he had finished creating on the sixth day, he said, everything that I have done there is good. That relationship between the man and the woman is good. It is only a relationship between a man and a woman. God didn't make a man to go with the man. He made a woman to go with the man. Okay? Man does not fit with man in a, in a marriage relationship. This he makes quite clear in Genesis 1. Now that's all very nice. But the trouble is, the fall came along. We had Adam and Eve tempted to eat of a fruit that they were not supposed to eat. And they began to know good and evil. And from then on, they couldn't cope. So what expressions do we get of the marriage relationship after that? When you read through the scriptures, you find automatically that the man is ruling over the woman. The woman, as we read through much of the Old Testament, we see the woman becoming a chattel, a good, an item that the man can dispose of whenever he wants to. The man was allowed more opportunities to divorce at that time than the woman. The woman wasn't in a very good state. The man treated her badly. And you can look around the world now and you can see exactly the same as men treat women so badly. It also happens the other way around because of the fall. But nevertheless, that is there. And as we saw on that, on that video, now we can easily say, yes, Let's enjoy what we can, but if I'm not happy with our relationship, we just split. It really doesn't matter. I mean, all right, we've got children, so what? They'll get over it. But that doesn't work, does it? Jesus changed all of that. And he brought us back to the central theme of the marriage relationship. And what is that central theme of the marriage relationship? is found in verse 24 of Genesis 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife or his woman, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. The importance of all of that is the one flesh. If a man has a relationship with a woman, they become one one flesh. So, we've got some odd verses coming up now which might challenge us. Matthew 5.31. Okay, Matthew 5.31. Jesus said, whoever sends his wife, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Have you read those verses? Have you ever come across those verses and thought, what actually does that mean? Luke sixteen eighteen. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. This is Jesus speaking. Now, the Pharisees of the time had a great difficulty with that because the Pharisees, the, the Pharisees follows the law and they were, they were permitted adultery. So let's see what Jesus says to these Pharisees. Matthew 19, 3. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them 
from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a, a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, this didn't go down too well with the disciples because they had been brought up under the law of Moses to see divorce. Divorce was part of life. And divorce, as you can see on that, that video, is part of our lives today. But Jesus points out that there is no divorce except from pornia, that is, adult, for immorality. Now, the word used, that he uses there, is, is pornia. And that means illicit sexual actions. So it means that the only way that you can divorce is through illicit sexual actions. Because that breaks up the oneness that God created. The oneness between man and woman is extremely important to God. That is the essential because it is part of what God is. God is one. We know there are three persons in the Trinity, but he is one. You cannot break that. And in the same way, the unity that we have between a man and a woman is one. We don't break that. So the disciples said to Jesus, well, if the relationship of the man and his wife is like this, it's best not to marry. So is it best not to marry? Is it best to remain single? Well, Jesus has allowed for this. If we look at Matthew 19, 9, he says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said, If the relationship of the man with the wife is like this, is it better not, better not to marry? But he said, Not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept this. So therefore, he's saying, look, it's okay to be single. Sometimes we pressurize our people today to get them married off. And in a lot of parts of the world, they, that they arrange for those marriages because they think that that is the only state that is acceptable to God. Quite clearly it isn't because Jesus says that's not. He said, if you want to remain single, that's fine. And if you want to remain single for the sake of the kingdom, that is really good. And we do have single people in this church and we ought to, we ought to, uh, I've lost the word now, sort of uh, encourage that sort of thing and say, yeah, well done. Well done. We support you in what you, in what you are. As you are single. Now Paul also encourages it. He says. Now concerning the things about which you wrote. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. The other way applies as well. It is good to be like that. And then comes a few words. Which makes things a little bit strange. And especially to us today. But. Because of immoralities, each man to have his own, is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. So if you can't control yourself sexually, then get married. That's what he's saying. Okay? If you are a couple and you can't control yourself in a sexual relationship, then you get married. The word he uses is pornias. Okay? 
Now what he's talking about here is intimate sexual relationships. Anything of that kind outside of the marriage of the man and the woman isn't on. And why isn't it on? It's because when that happens, the sexual relationship happens, you become one. You become one. So that means if I'm having sex with three or four girls, okay, I'm not having it. It's not one, is it? It's four in this relationship. The relationship I had with the first one is one. And now I've broken that relationship. I've broken what God requires with my first lady. And similarly, the reverse is true. We have broken what God has required in the oneness of the, human, of the male and female. In verse 9, Paul says, But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burden, than to burn with passion. The word porn, porneus, is used for pornography as well in this world. We describe things that we might see. There are many people that like looking at images of men or of women in an undressed state or in acts of, of sexual relationships. Others will have posters on the wall of, of, of women in various states of dress and some even of men in states of dress. That is all covered by the word pornia. That is meaning we are coming to lust after these photographs of those people. Okay? That is adultery. That is adultery. We've never taken that on before, but what God is saying is because you are lusting after somebody else, that is as bad as the actual act. Now, for a lot of us in this room, and I include myself amongst them, that has been a difficult bit. How do we deal with our mind? How do we deal with controlling watching our television and all of these things that are going on? Because when I take that lust upon myself, I am breaking my oneness with my wife. I am committing adultery. And so it is the other way around. God says marriage is to be held in honour amongst all and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators... The word again is pornea, again those that are in a relationship with other people or they've got it going on in their mind and adulterers God will judge, God will judge. So therefore we should be careful how we walk, not as the unwise but as wise. Now why is it should we just obey God in this? I mean, this all seems rather harsh, doesn't it? That even my thoughts are going to be judged by God in those particular issues. And they're all right, I might get carried away and make a mistake and, and, and have a relationship with somebody that I shouldn't. It's a bit harsh that God says, look, I'm going to judge you on that, isn't it? When Paul went to the disciples in Acts, in Acts 15, 28 and 29, he went asking about, should Gentiles obey the law? And they discussed this and came to the conclusion through the leading of the Holy Spirit that they should only abstain from idols, blood, things strangled, and fornication. You see, it's another important issue that comes back, comes again, that we tend to forget. These things are important. So why should we be like this? Why is God demanding this of us? Well, 
When Jesus came to this earth, he came because we were falling apart, we were disowning God, and he came to bring a kingdom. Because the Jews, who were the nation that was supposed to show the world that God is, and God loves, and God demands respect and love as well, had failed. They had taken it upon themselves to say, look at us, we are brilliant, we're Jews, we're God's chosen people, and had forgotten that there was a need for the world to also know God. So God sent Jesus, and he died on a cross for each one of us. In 1 Corinthians 6.9, I'm going to read the whole of this passage here, because this places it just where we should all be. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Here he's making it quite clear, isn't he? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, there's that word again, pornoia, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. Such, yes, that was our state. Such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And so he goes on to say, therefore, because you were justified, because you were sanctified, because you have given your life to me, to Jesus, because of that, because I died on the cross for you and took your sins, because of that, this is how we should aim to behave. Paul goes on, all things are lawful for me. Since we came to Christ, we're free. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. So although God says, yes, you are free, you're freed from all of this, but not everything is profitable. Not all the things that can be done are for the good. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, that's pornier again, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise, up through his power, raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Do we not know that our bodies are now members of Christ? If we have come to Christ, that is where our bodies are. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute, poor Nays again, is one body with her? Do we see that? That's the importance of these relationships. For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Pornaeum again. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral, Poinuan again, man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Sometimes we tend to think that our body is separate from our spiritual life, but it isn't. It is all tied up together. We can do anything we like with our body. We can harm our body. We do anything with it. If we want to have a sexual relationship, we can do that. It's no harm. But here he, Paul is saying quite clearly, look, that's not the way to continue. You marry if you can't control your sexual feelings and you stay married. No excuses. You stay married. But then we live in the world, don't we? We live in this world which is fallen. It's got its own values and the kingdom of God has got its own values. How do we remain in that? We remain in that by walking with God. Ephesians 
5.15 Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. It goes on to say that Christ is the head of the church. That just as, just as Christ loves his church, so husbands should love their wives. That is an impossible task. Being a husband myself, I know that I fail that continually. But nevertheless, that is what he is asking. He's also asking his wives, as he goes on, to submit to the husband. Now, that is another difficult task for the woman to submit to the husband, especially when he's bad. It doesn't say submit to the good husbands, but don't submit to the bad husband. It says submit. Because we, as a body, submit to Christ. Now, when Christ considers us as a church and how we behave, he must get very disappointed. But yet he still loves us and he has that compassion with which he's going to deal with us. And so when we come to these issues where we do sin, we do let him down. We have a saviour that we can go and speak about. Speak to, sorry, speak to. And this is how our lives should be, forever sharing those things. We spoke about prayer with the children. Prayer is one of the most important aspects of our lives. It, relay, it retains that communion with God. And that is so much that we need because life is hard. We live this side of the fall. Men and women don't get on as God had first required them to get on because we have fallen. We know good and evil and therefore we behave badly. But he is still there encouraging us to live as he would have us. To remember that as far as husbands and wives are concerned, we are one body. We are one in the flesh. We are one, a unity. As far as single people are concerned, you are there to live your life for God. Not for other things, but for God. And then he will introduce you to these other things. Finishing off, in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, Paul writes, Finally then, brethren, we request you and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instructions as to how you ought to walk and please God, that you excel still more. For you know what the commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, he's making us holy. He is pre presenting us holy. He is working out holiness in our lives. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honour. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not go, know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as we told you before and solemnly warn you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but for sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the importance. We belong to God. If we act in that way, we are dishonouring him. So let's just consider those things in a quiet now before God. Let's consider what pornography is, what adultery is. It's not just a physical act, it's our thoughts as well. Watching things on the television, perhaps we should not be watching. Going out to watch or picking up magazines that we should not be looking at. All these are destructive and are going to destruct that, going to destroy the oneness that we have in our wives, with our wives and with our husbands, whoever, whichever of the partner does that. <laughs> 